Hello, everyone. Wow, that was a freaky moment that I had there. I had a freaky moment there just a second ago because my uh, my computer tech didn't uh, didn't connect. It looks like we are in good shape now, and I would love to get confirmation of that fact um, from all or any of you out there. Um, it looks like we are in good shape. So if we are, if that is to say, if you can see me and if you can hear me, let me know about that in the chat box. Um, and once I see uh, that you guys are uh, that you guys are all there. Let's see if we uh, if if th if this live stream is working and our our uh, our connect connectivity is okay. I'll give you a few seconds to sort of chime in. I think that things look okay on my end. I'd love to hear from any or all of you that things look okay on your end. Jerry, you can see and hear me. Myra can see and hear me. Joyce, thank you so much. That was a that was a freaky one. As I uh, as I clicked the buttons, all the tech usually works. Today it uh, had trouble connecting. So I think we are in good shape. Um, it looks like there's nearly forty of us on already. Um, that number tends to go up in and in, in these first couple of minutes. And as it does, um, let's uh, let's let's play a little game I like to uh, I like to start off with as people are streaming into our chat room here um, we are in the end of the football season I'm not a huge football fan but I like a good game here and there and so I have a question for all of you you can pipe in in the chat who do you pick as the winner of the Super Bowl this year um, we have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on one side led by Tom Brady um, and we're gonna get more on Tom Brady here in a minute uh, and then the Kansas City Chiefs that's Patrick Mahomes uh, nearly 20 years between those guys those quarterbacks let me see uh, where we are coming from as a group here in terms of your pick for the Super Bowl and I will tell you why I'm using a Super Bowl metaphor here in just a moment let me see uh, let me see you chime in in that chat box for who uh, who you pick who you're rooting for who you're <laughs> rich wants the 49ers good for you um, I'm, a, I'm a California born and bred loved Joe Montana back in the day thanks for that rich Pat's got the Chiefs. Um, so Tom Brady, 43 years old. He was born in 1977 compared to Patrick Mahomes, who uh, is a, a mere 25 years old, born in 1995, the same year that Tom Brady uh, graduated from high school, which is remarkable. Um, it turns out I did a quick little search, and it, it, I didn't realize this, but Tom Brady was drafted um, by Major League Baseball back then at the end of his high school season uh, and opted to play football instead, which is a remarkable thing what an athlete uh, that he is. Um, and you saw, for all of you who are on here now, that the, the, the title of our discussion today is about aging in reverse. And we're, we're talking specifically about uh, about the immune system, immunological aging. Um, and I use Tom Brady for obvious reasons. Here we have a 43-year-old man who's the, uh, the quarterback of an NFL football team who, who may well win a Super Bowl this year. Um, and it certainly seems like he is either either not aging at all or or maybe even aging in reverse. It's remarkable. We, we for Any of you who follow his career know that he's very, very into natural medicine, diet, lifestyle. Uh, and so clearly that is paying off for him. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about aging in reverse. So hang around for this conversation. Please stick around throughout the, throughout the whole thing till the end. Um, at the end, I have a special immune-related gift for all of you uh, who are willing to hang out um, and uh, here, here today with me for the, uh, for the remainder of our session today. So today what we're going to do is I'm looking at, at the, uh, at the chat here. We got, we got a, a, a good blend here of people from uh, who are voting for either the 49ers who are not in it this year, the chiefs, the bucks, uh, we'll see how it goes. Good luck to all of you sports fans out there. Um, and uh, I see uh, Roger says it's coming in good. He's on a cold, windy day. It is a cold and windy day here in Connecticut. It was nine degrees when I woke up this morning, freezing, freezing cold. So, um, our discussion for today is a deep dive into your immune system, into immunity in general, how it's supposed to work, what can happen when it doesn't work. And then in keeping with our football theme, we are going to think about this as defense, as offense, and as special teams. That's our construct. That's how I laid out my notes, which all of you are welcome to have. Uh, we will send you links to those notes. Uh, you don't need to keep a pen and paper unless you like to do that. Uh, I have an extensive set of notes for all of you that are here today, uh, so you can just lay back and relax. Uh, and it's structured in that way. Defense, offense, and special teams, a really perfect sort of algorithm in which to have a conversation about immunity. So I guess that makes me your head coach for today. Um, hopefully I'm qualified to do that. So let's get started. Um, let's, 
let's start with some lessons that came from 2020, right? If 2020 taught us anything, it is the, the critical importance of our age as relates to the function or the dysfunction of our immune systems. Um, this really kind of became clear to me in a really cool way um, by the good people at a place called Everest Health, a, a healthcare company. And they created something that they call an immunological age calculator. I'm going to send in my notes, I put a link to this particular calculator for you because I think you'll find it fascinating in the same way that I did. What this calculator does is it predicts outcomes for hospitalizations, intensive care unit admissions, and uh, death mortality based on the answers to a few simple questions that give the tool, the artificial intelligence tool, information about your risks, right? And so I'm gonna go through just briefly what those questions are. And I wanna just explain this tool is really, really fascinating. So you put in the, the inputs, your inputs to these answers to these various questions, and then you can see you, they're toggles, right? So they have little switches that you can move back and forth. And if you move them, you can see how your risk for any of those parameters, right? Uh, hospitalization, ICU, or death change based on your answers to those questions. So what are the, what are the questions that determine this immunological risk? Well, they're, they're really simple. Um, the first one is your age. Um, and here we are talking about aging in reverse, immunological aging. It's this, a primary subject of our discussion because it's so important for immune system health and the ability of your immune system to properly defend you and keep you safe. So age is number one. Uh, your gender, that matters too. Uh, your height, and the reason why their height matters is because it's used as part of a calculation for your BMI, your body mass index. Uh, height. It, it's a calculation that involves your height, uh, your weight, your age, and your gender. Then the next question is about underlying conditions. You've heard of these before. And in this particular calculator, and in, in any immunological risk calculator, we're talking about chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, or any other immunocompromise, immunocompromising illness. So that's that's a category you check the box if you have any of those things. There's a calculation uh, for using weight to calculate the BMI, the body mass index. There's a number about your waist measurement, which is probably a slightly more refined way to assess risk, um, body type, obesity, uh, than just purely calculations of BMI. So the waist measurement is on there. Um, whether or not one smokes, that's uh, number seven, your smoking status. And then there's blood pressure, another very important risk factor for all, all kinds of things. Mostly we think of it for heart disease risk, but it's also important for immunologic risk as well. Um, your vitamin D level, that's the next one. That's number nine on this calculator, your vitamin D level. And it's really, really fascinating. I don't know if you know your vitamin D level. Hopefully you do. Uh, we check a, a blood test commonly in the office and we shoot for a target of around 50. Uh, that's the number that I'd like all of you to get to. Um, and if you take that little toggle switch on this Everest health calculator, you'll see that low vitamin D levels, all the risks go up. High vitamin D levels, the risks go down. Fascinating to watch how that moves as you toggle the vitamin D level. We'll talk more about that shortly. Um, number 10 is an interesting one that probably most of you don't know or haven't even heard about in many cases, uh, which is called a flow mediated dilation score. This is something, uh, kind of a newer fancy test that can be done with a blood pressure cuff to to assess the elasticity, the rebound, the flexibility of one's arteries. And flow-mediated dilation is indeed a risk uh, for heart disease, not surprisingly, and also uh, for immunologic health as well. Number 11, and there's just one more after this, is the hemoglobin A1C. Uh, does any, anybody ever heard of that before? Give me a thumbs up. I like to keep the chat going in the, uh, in, in the chat box there. Anyone ever heard of hemoglobin A1C? And extra points for people who know what it is and what it's for. Let me just look at that chat real quick and see what, uh, what kind of answers we get. There's a little bit of a delay in the chat, so I, uh, I'll give you a moment, and I'll take that moment to take a sip of my tea. Here we go. Rich, Rich left a comment and it says 15 down to nine. Um, I think that Rich is referring to the hemoglobin A1C um, and maybe he's referring to his number it used to be 15 and is now nine. If that's true, that's fantastic. 15 was not so good. Um, Joyce says, yes, sir. 
Uh, Susan says measure blood glucose. Uh, Roger, thumbs up. It's a blood sugar indicator. Yes. Uh, Zeniata, Emily, and John, you're right. John got it really specifically, your glucose over time. Yes, hemoglobin A1C is a measurement of blood glucose control over a period of time. We put about three months on that period of time. So blood glucose finger prick is like today at that minute, what your sugar is right then. Uh, hemoglobin A1C is a calculation based on what your blood sugar has been, how controlled it's been over a period of time. And it's a very, very important indicator uh, for health across the board, morbidity and mortality from all kinds of different illnesses. So very, very important uh, measure. And that's one uh, number 11 on the risk calculator. And then number 12, is a, is a common one that we've all heard of before. Most of us have had this tested, often annually at least, uh, and that is cholesterol. The cholesterol numbers are broken down on this risk calculator um, into their component parts. HDL, the, the cholesterol we call good cholesterol, LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, and then triglycerides. And similarly, on this uh, risk calculator that I'm referring to, toggling those switches, if the HDL is lower, the risk is higher. Uh, if the triglycerides are higher, the risk is higher. You get the idea. Um, and so I really, you, like I said, there's a there's a link in the notes to this calculator, and I think it's really, really instructive to understand how all of these parameters, including your age and all these other factors, contribute to your immunologic risk. It's, it's a really, really instructive tool. I really wish that at the beginning of 2020, or even well before that, we had had the ability to sort of, everyone understood their risk. I mean, imagine what, how different the world would be if everyone knew their risk. Everyone knew you know, where they fell in terms of the answers, uh, the, the toggle switches on that calculator. And then we could stratify people according to their risk, right? We understand not, it's not just age. There's a lot more to it than that. And then we could make public health decisions based on risk stratification. That would be really elegant. Um, we didn't do such a great job of that. Hopefully there's not going to be a next time, um, but uh, but risk stratification based on immunologic risk is really, really interesting uh, and very, very instructive. So the, the two big lessons that I take away from uh, immune-related risk calculations are these. Number one, and it's kind of obvious at this point, there are some risk factors that are entirely outside of your control, right? Until we find the real fountain of youth, age is one of those risk factors, right? We don't have a fountain of youth. We, uh, you know, yes, we're talking about aging in reverse. I wish that I could just dial it back for all of you and myself sometimes. But right now, age is a risk factor that's outside of our control. But as you heard me go through the uh, elements of this calculator, there are many, many more risk factors that are absolutely in our control. And that is what we're here to talk about today. So without further ado, let's let's get into it. Um, we're, we're talking about immune system health. And one of the primary concerns that we have when we're talking about immune system health is your ability to defend yourself against infection, right? That's really what we're talking about here. Your immune system is your primary defense against infection. And that's what we're talking about. And I'd like to, I'd like to frame this for you. Um, every infection, minor ones, serious ones, viruses, bacteria, fungi, every infection is a relationship. Uh, it's, a, it's a weird way to, to sort of describe an infection. Most people who have an infection don't think about it that way, but I think it's important that we do. Every infection is a relationship. It's a relationship between an organism, virus, bacteria, fungus, and a host. In this case, you. Um, maybe some part of you, your skin, your lungs, wherever the infection may be. Every infection is a relationship between an organism and a host. And the outcome of that relationship, how things pan out, depend on features that are related to the organism and features that are related to the host, like those risk factors that we were just talking about now. Is everybody with me there? We're understanding the, uh, the, the, the fact that a relationship, that an infection is a relationship between an organism and a host. And sometimes the organism has a lot of strength and sometimes the host has a lot of weakness or vice versa. The outcome of that relationship is determined by both of those factors. 
So a lot of times I, I like to think about this this way, you know, a cheetah, for example, on the, on the African plains, you know, you get to, if you're lucky enough to get to go on a safari and see a cheetah chase a herd of, of, of antelope or something like that. A lot of times the predator catches the antelope, the weakest, slowest, in some cases, sickest one that's at the back of the herd. They're the easy, easiest to catch, right? The fast, healthy, youthful, robust antelopes. Those guys are at the front of the pack and they are more likely to be spared, right? The ones who are at the back of the pack, older, weaker, sicker, uh, you know, th those are the ones who are the most vulnerable, right? And anytime an organism is spreading through a family, a community, a planet, that is very much like a cheetah on the prowl, right? Um, and what we want to do is we want to do whatever we can do to be the antelopes that are at the front of the pack ourselves and for the people that we care about, the people in our homes and for those who might be weaker or more vulnerable for whatever reason, we need to protect them uh, with all uh, available resources. That's the way I like to think about infection um, before we get into the conversation about your immune system and how hit, how it is involved in keeping you to be that 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 fastest, quickest, strongest antelope at the front of the pack, right? So what that's about is about optimizing your own health, especially the health of your immune system, so that it can do what it is designed to do, what it's best at doing, and that is protecting you, keeping you safe. So, everybody, good? I'm. Uh, do for another sip of tea, and then we're going to go back to football, starting with the defense. Thank you, Roger. Appreciated my illustration with my words there. Um, and yes, the notes uh, will be on the way. For all of you who are interested in the notes, and there's a lot more detail um, uh, right here ahead in the next several minutes, um, the notes will be coming your way. So just uh, just leave, uh, you don't need to do anything. If you signed up via email, uh, my team will gladly send you a beautifully prepared set of notes, uh, very much similar to the ones that I'm working off of here for our conversation. So we're now uh, diving into the immune system and we're going to go back to this uh, this upcoming Super Bowl and our our big challenge between between Brady who seems to be aging in reverse and and uh, and, and Mahomes who uh, hasn't yet aged uh, young man there and you can think of your immune system as a well-coached football team. Like I said earlier, we're talking about defense, we're talking about offense, and we're talking about special teams. Please stick around for our discussion of special teams. I think that's the most important part of what we're here to talk about today. Um, so let's start with defense. There's a lot that mainstream medicine, conventional medicine gets right about this. Immunological defense is really important and you've heard a lot about this in the last year. I'm talking about the very basics, defensive strategies, and that means washing your hands, yes, and you should do that and you should do it frequently and you should do it correctly. Soap and water for 20 seconds, always think of your hands as contaminated. Um, I have a little, maybe slightly disgusting example for you here. I have a dog. I'm sure many of you do too. Um, feel free to type the name of your dog in the chat box as we're talking here. My dog is named Rhea and she's actually sitting right over here. Hopefully she'll stay quiet. She's my partner in this immunologic talk. Um, so yeah, I have a dog um, and anybody who has a dog knows that one of the dirty jobs involving uh, involving dog ownership is uh, is picking up poop, right? And hopefully, you know, everything goes well and you use your little baggie or a gloved hand to do that, to do that dirty work. But every now and then, I'm sure it's happened to all of us, you get a little mess on your finger. There's a hole in the bag, something happens and uh-oh, I'm contaminated. And when that happens, all of us sort of, at least this happens to me, I'm sure this happens to you as well, you realize, you fully understand that your hand, your finger is contaminated. And you just sort of like have this new frame of mind about your hand and about that mess that's on it. And you don't do anything with that hand until you wash it with soap and water, right? It's this sort of sense, the sixth sense that you have, I am contaminated. What I'd like for you all to think about is anytime you're out in the world, if you, you're, you're out in the world, in stores and wherever it is that your hands are contaminated, right? And until you wash them and decontaminate them, just think about it that way. Like you got that little piece of dog poop on your hands. That's my metaphor for you. And if you think about it that way, you'll keep your hands hopefully away from your face, away from your food plate, etc. 
right? So that's a uh, hand washing is important. Think of yourself as contaminated. It does go a very long way. Um, and then you could, of course, minimize handshaking, using fist bumps. I think it's been a long time coming. Uh, elbow taps, these sorts of things that people are doing these days. Handshakes are a great way to pass uh, germs from one person to another. Uh, they used to probably have a good use in society. Uh, you know, I come uh, unarmed um, and I come in peace, that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's fine for us to move past the handshake and give somebody a good bit of eye contact and a fist bump. That accomplishes the job of I come in peace perfectly well. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about two big volatile topics um, uh, about masks, but they are important, and about vaccines, which are also important. This conversation, I'm going to avoid the use of, uh, of the C word. I'm not going to take any direct questions about the C word. This is uh, to reach the largest possible audience uh, with information that's just broadly and generally useful about immune system health. Um, and there's lots of regulators who are policing uh, all sorts of content. Um, that relates to the C word. So we want to just sort of avoid that topic and, and, and spend time just speaking more generally uh, about the immune system. So everybody with me, we uh, we talked about defense, classic defensive strategies. Um, not terribly sexy, I understand that, but very, very effective. Uh, that was immune defense. And now we're going to get into a, 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 a fascinating topic, and this is about the immune system's offense. Um, to understand how your immune system works really is to be in awe. It's um, it's it's unbelievably complex, and I'm going to get back to awe in just a moment. Here is a little lesson for you about immunology 101, immunological offense. Okay, so the first bit is. And the, the most important function of the immune system, this is really sort of the first lesson for any budding immunologist. The most important function of an immune system is to distinguish between self and non-self, right? Between us and them. That's the most important thing. If you're in any kind of military or have any military experience, I do not. Um, but I imagine that those are really important lessons there as well. This is us. These are the uniforms that we wear. Anything that's not us is them, right? Us, in this case, in medicine and immunology, refers to our, our flesh and our blood, right? Every cell, every tissue, every organ, that is us. So give me thumbs up if you understand. We have to distinguish between us and them. That's a very important first step. Us is us, inside of us, you know, what we are made of, our very own flesh and blood. And them, of course, is everything else, right? And what do I mean by everything else? By everything else, I mean foods that you're exposed to. Those are not you. They can become a part of you. But at the outset, when you put them in your mouth, they're not you. Foods is them, right? Microorganisms, virus, bacteria, fungi. Those are them as well. Yes, there are many that live in, in us, in our GI tracts and on us, but microorganisms are not us, right? They are, they are them. And anything that we are exposed to that is not us. So my dog's dander, your cat's dander, the clothing, the fibers in the clothing that we wear, the personal care products, the air we breathe or the particles in the air we breathe, everything that we are exposed to that is not us is them. And the fundamental job of the immune system, the first job is to determine what is us and what is them. That's part A. From there, the next lesson goes like this. The immune system needs to determine whether or not them, whether or not that outsider is a friend or is a foe or an enemy, right? So once we've established, yep, this is me, and that, whatever that is, food, virus, bacteria, dog, dander, is not me, then there's a really important, critical decision point. And that decision point is, is this them, is this outsider safe? Is it friendly or is it an enemy, right? That's part, job number two. And if that process, that process of determining, you know, friend or foe, breaks down for any reason, or even if the process of determining us versus them breaks down for any reason, and the immune system loses that ability to discriminate, then you can get yourself into what we call a friendly fire situation, 
right? Imagine the soldier who gets confused, right? Who sees uh, uh, someone on his own in his own army or her own army wearing an enemy uniform, right? That blurs the line. Now the soldier's confused. Is that us? Is that them? Makes that quick decision. Is that outsider if that decision is wrong oh i think that's them and it looks like an enemy and and that soldier starts to shoot well you've got a big big problem right and so the immune system's ability to discriminate between us and them is fundamental and um if that process breaks down you can wind up in a friendly fire situation and that is essentially what is happening in autoimmune diseases right so autoimmune diseases there's a whole bunch of them many many different illnesses that can affect virtually every body system but the common thread between all of them is that the immune system has lost its ability. It, it, it lost that ability to discriminate between us and them, and it goes on the attack against us. And your immune system is a vicious killer. That's what it's designed to do. It's a vicious system. And if you are under attack by your own immune system, maybe that's your thyroid, maybe it's your skin, maybe it's your joints, maybe it's your GI tract, maybe it's a portion of your brain or nerves. There's autoimmune diseases in every body system where the immune system loses its ability to discriminate like that and attacks oneself. And that's a whole category of illnesses, mostly treated by rheumatologists called autoimmune diseases. You can really witness the ravaging power of a human immune system if you've ever seen somebody suffering or if you've suffered yourself from an autoimmune disease. Um, so that's, here we are kind of like moving along in our lesson, uh, immunology 101 and understanding us versus them, friend versus foe. So when things are going well and the immune system recognizes them, the outsider, as something that's non-toxic, like this is when the system works well, like let's say uh, I take a cup, I take a drink of tea, which I need right now. There's immune system cells in my mouth, underneath my tongue, that are recognizing these little signals that are amino acid sequences in the tea, quite literally, it's them. And so far, so good. My immune system seems like, yep, it recognized that there was a them there, that an outsider came in, but no reaction, right? Uh, it's something that's non-toxic. It's something that's safe. It's a food. It's a piece of clothing on your skin. It's a piece of dog dander. It's a friendly microorganism. The immune system's job when it's working well is to recognize that it's friendly, safe, non-toxic, and not react, right? Immunologists call this non-reaction. We call it tolerance, right? Um, it's a good word, right? Tolerance is when an immune system doesn't react, it tolerates the thing. Just like my immune system just tolerated that T and my immune system in my lungs is tolerating uh, Rhea's, uh, Rhea's dog dander that's undoubtedly in the in the air here, we're tolerating. And that is what that's what you want, right? You want your immune system to tolerate. In other words, it's not us, it's a them, but it's just a harmless civilian. Relax, tolerate, chill out, right? That's what's supposed to happen. Now, the way that this recognition between us and them occurs is really important, fundamental to our understanding of immunity in general. And it's something that's just, it's awesome. It's an awesome process to understand. And it's amazing to think that every minute of every day, this remarkably complex, highly efficient process is happening inside of our bodies. It's really something wondrous. Um, Everything we get exposed to, whether it's us or them, is wearing some kind of uniform, like I said, and I'm going to get detailed here in the best way that I can to explain an extremely complex phenomenon in words that I hope you can understand. So please give me the thumbs up if I'm doing a good job. This is, is high-tech immunology here, and I think that I have a construct, a way to explain it that'll help you understand it and be as in awe of it as I have been for my entire career. So here we go. Everything that we get exposed to, the stuff in us, us, and the stuff outside of us, them, the outsiders, is wearing a uniform. It's sort of like a molecular name tag, if you will. And there are little, these little tiny molecular flags, molecular name tags that are sticking up on the surfaces of everything, right? On the surfaces of our own cells. Every cell has these little name tags on it microorganisms, viruses, bacteria, et cetera, they have their own set of little molecular name tags that are sticking up. Foods we eat have those name tags. The clothes you wear, everything, 
the particles in the air you breathe, everything has a name tag. And those little molecular name tags, those little flags are called antigens, A-N-T-I-G-E-N, antigen. It's very important. Everything in the world, in us, cellular material has antigens, okay? So our immune system is stocked with a vast circulating pool of something called antibodies. I'm sure that you all have heard of antibodies before, and they are circulating in our, around in our bloodstream by the trillions. And these are like one half of, of a lock and key mechanism, one side of a, a one jigsaw puzzle piece that wants to interact with another. It's like a lock and key system. And they are constantly circulating around. Those are antibodies and they are sampling the antigens. Like there's one jigsaw puzzle piece or lock or key. You could think about it that way. It's just circulating around and it's just checking things out. And when I breathe in some dog dander or when I drink a cup of tea or when I eat some food or I get exposed to a virus or bacteria, that little reaction is taking place where the key is just testing the lock, testing the lock, testing the lock, right? And this sampling is going on constantly. It's antibodies sampling antigens that we are exposed to to see if there's a match. It's sort of like randomly testing every single jigsaw puzzle piece to see if it fits. And then when it does, when the antibody and the antigen form a bond, they link like that, that is when the magic happens. And that magic happening can go one of two ways. One, tolerance, right? React, I found a match, no big deal, right? That's what you want to happen. Well, that's what you want to happen if the substance that you got exposed to really is no big deal, right? I don't wanna have a reaction to this tea. I don't wanna have a reaction to everything that I get exposed to. That would be, that would be a nightmare. So if the exposure, if the antigen is attached to something that's safe, harmless, we want no reaction. We want tolerance. But if the antigen is attached to something that's potentially dangerous, yeah, we want a reaction. We want the alarm bells to ring. We want a reaction. We want a call for backup, right? So when we get exposed to something and the antigen from the something and the antibody from your immune system, make a link and ring the alarm. That's when, like I said, the magic happens. When the immune system recognizes an invasion like that and determines that it could be dangerous and it needs to be disposed of, it needs to be handled. What happens is the antibody antigen complex, that's those two puzzle pieces together. That's the key in the lock. That whole thing together starts sounding the alarm. And it initiates this massively complex, extremely efficient, extremely well-coordinated cascade of events that, number one, creates more antibodies, right? It's amazing. We got exposed to an antigen. We don't like it. Right away, a signal gets sent back to the mothership of the immune system. We found a circulating antigen that is, a, that is dangerous. I need more keys to fit that lock and they come flooding out of the lymph nodes in the immune system by the trillions quickly, right? It's an amazing mobilization of reaction. Antigen antibody complex, bam, we have a link, the alarm goes off, a message, chemical message gets sent back to the immune system and antibodies start flooding out by the trillions. That's the first thing. And then those antibodies are carried on immune, immune system cells within the bloodstream and, and other types of cells as well that deliver more of those antibodies and those defensive cells, well, in this case, offensive cells, to the scene of the crime, right? And more and more troops start to come to the scene to sort of do the dirty work, right? To do the cleanup, to kill the microorganism to encapsulate and dispose of whatever the toxin may be. That's the awesomeness that is an immunologic reaction. It is a truly awesome process to behold. It's a marvel to even understand how complex a process like that is going on inside of our body every second, every minute, every day throughout your entire life. It's, um, it's remarkable. So Think about that for a second, and then I'm just going to take a slight U-turn, just a quick U-turn as I take a cup of tea, um, to talk about awe for just a moment. Everybody with me? 
I love the thumbs up, you guys. Thank you so much. There's over 100 of you here. It's a, um, it's a, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor, a privilege to be here with you. And um, it's, uh, it tickles me to know that you guys appreciate uh, the content that I'm providing to you here. So um, thank you for that. And a uh, little, little feedback in that chat box goes a long way. Moving right along, we're on, on offense. We're about to get to special teams, but I'm going to take a slight diversion, a little bit of a U-turn a side road here to talk about awe. And awe, I mean A-W-E. Um, the the uh, the root word of the word awesome. I just described to you certainly what I think and what I hope that you think is an awesome process. By the way, there's awesome processes happening in our bodies all the time, and there's awesomeness really kind of everywhere if you really um, if you really think about it. Here's my quick diversion: a, a, a research study that I think is fascinating. I want to share with you. So, we have long known that. There, that positive emotions, things like compassion and love and joy and pride and gratitude, these things are good for our health. The, the science has figured this out. People who experience those kinds of positive emotions more, they have better health. Um, it's associated with lower risks of all sorts of different diseases. Um, and there's even some, uh, some studies that demonstrate lower levels of biomarkers on inflammation. Correspondingly, you know, people who experience uh, negative emotions, things like, uh, you know, anger and fear and all the negative stuff, th there's th those are associated with worse health outcomes. That's not a huge surprise. Um, it's really interesting and not a big surprise, you know, for a naturopathic doctor like me who th sort of thinks holistically. And I think a lot of you, um, a lot of you also think holistically, understand the connectedness, you know, inside our bodies, within our, our families and our communities, and even in the, in the planet and the environment as a whole, understanding that good emotions, positive emotions are associated with better health is not a huge surprise, but it's, it's neat, right? But a few years ago, there was a really interesting study. This was out of UC Berkeley. And what they, what they wanted to look at was to, they wanted to study and figure out which one of the positive emotions had the greatest impact on inflammatory markers, right? And they they were looking at this this chemical called interleukin six, which is one of those chemical messengers uh, uh, that's part of an immune system response and a marker of inflammation. And we talked about last week inflammation, uh, excessive chronic inflammation is not a good thing. So these researchers did. Uh, a study looking at and investigating how often people experience all these different emotions and to what extent, which one. And it turns out that of all of the positive emotions, the one that is most strongly associated with decreased levels of inflammatory markers or better immunity was awe, A-W-E, awe. So people who experience awe more frequently, more regularly, it's more a part of their life, have better immune systems. I mean, that in itself is awesome to behold, right? And so what's what's the lesson here? I, I, what I would encourage you to do and what I try to do is just look for it, right? It's there. The awesomeness is everywhere. And, and it doesn't matter what you're interested in. I happen to be interested in science and the human body. So things like how the immune system work put me in awe. I've mentioned my dog a few times. I'm in awe of her, her beauty, her politeness, you know, her her speed and agility, all the things, you know, and, and we go out in the woods and I'm in awe of what I see in nature. So, you know, awe is something that is everywhere. You just have to look for it. And if you do, you will find it. And when you do, if you find it more and more, you will have improvements in markers of chronic inflammation, in markers of immunological health. So it's kind of awesome. Um, so th there you have that. Um, one little, little side note for you before we get into our conversation about special teams. Special teams, I think, is the bit of this presentation that many of you kind of came for um, to talk about the diet, the lifestyle, and then nutritional and herbal supplements for what we'll call awesome immunity. All right. Um, I'm going to take you through the, the foundations, the basics. And again, for those of you who are just joining us uh, more recently, you will get a copy of the notes. You don't need to take notes yourself. I've got all this for you. My team will send it out to you afterwards. So stick around through special teams, and then I'll tell you about that that special immunologic gift that I have for you uh, right just a few minutes away. So immunity and special teams. It starts, and this is not going to surprise any of you, with food. It starts with food. The diet is foundational. It's we are what we eat, right? Like our cellular structure is built from the raw materials that we consume. And so starting with a minimally processed, 
plant-based anti-inflammatory diet is the most appropriate diet for optimal immunity. And here's what that means. That means eating foods that come from the earth in a minimally processed form as much as possible. Single ingredient foods, vegetables, fruits, beans, nuts, seeds, whole grains, and yes, animal protein as well. It fits in, into this conversation. I'm talking about eggs. I'm talking about dairy. I'm talking about meats. But only if those animal products are coming from well-fed, well-raised, you might call them happy, healthy animals, right? The way we raise our livestock um, for our meats and for our eggs and for our dairy products is uh, horrifying, is one, one way to describe it. Uh, and it's not good for the animals, it's not good for the planet, and it's not good for you, most importantly. So I am not opposed to the eating of animal protein, although I do believe that it ought to be minimized and uh, and only eaten exclusively from healthy, happy animals. Yes, that will cost you a little bit more, that's true, but you'll be eating correspondingly less. So I would decrease the quantity and increase the quality. Um, and and those do count as, a, as what I would call a minimally processed food. So that's dietary advice number one. I'm like a broken record on that, but it's a very important record to keep on keep on playing. Number two is to minimize or avoid added sugars in the diet, uh, especially uh, high fructose corn syrup, highly processed sugars like that, and the unhealthy fats that are found in fried foods, foods that are processed with these ultra processed industrial seed oils, um, vegetable oil sounds good. Uh, it's not necessarily good for you because as we talked about last week, um, has problematic fats that compromise uh, your immune system health because of the way they interact with your cell membrane. So minimizing sugar and minimizing bad fats, dietary advice number two. Three, and this one might surprise you, lots and lots of spices, right? Go get that spice rack out, keep them out on the counter. I don't care which ones they are, ginger, garlic, turmeric, oregano, thyme, rosemary, all the spices are powerful, powerful sources of antioxidants, immune enhancing compounds. Many of them are directly antiviral and immune supportive. It's it's interesting historically to think that 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 you know explorers went on explorations at, you know at great risk of life and limb to go find spices. You know Th these world explorers were you know sent off from kings and queens in Europe and other places to go find peppercorns or cinnamon or these sorts of things. And now, you know, they're relegated to like a, you know, a, a, a three inch jar, a little circular jar in the back of a cabinet that's been there for years. These things are prized possessions. They were prized possessions back then, and they should still be thought of as prized possessions now. Spice your food, right? And it doesn't need to be spicy or hot, pungent on the tongue. Um, eat more spices. Um, they are immunologically active, uh, all of them. There's there's nothing that I can say bad about any spices. Um, and they're Im immensely useful and vastly underused. I think they're a major, major deficiency uh, in the American diet. And we can do um, a whole webinar like this on just spices alone. Perhaps we should do that one of these days. Uh, a very, very hot topic, um, pun intended there. They are immune supportive. So go big on spices um, and go replace them. They're not in, they're not expensive now. That's a luxury of living in the modern world. Get some new spices and learn to use them. Um, number four, this is bits of lifestyle advice for optimal or awesome immunity is, I'm going to call it the three S's, and that is sleep, more is better. We all know this. Most of us aren't sleeping enough. Um, make the room dark. Put the electronic devices away at least an hour before bed. Cool the temperature down in your in your bedroom. It's not going to be hard to do that around here tonight. Um, and um, and get to sleep a little bit earlier. Um, sleep is medicine for immunity. There's no question about it. Um, minimize or better manage your stress. Um, there's two parts to that, right? One part is to minimize, um, to reduce stress. And I understand that is not always easy, right? Reducing stress, sometimes it's there. It's not always uh, so easily inside of our control. Uh, and then number two, which is perhaps more important, even if you have some stress and you can't really actively minimize it, is to learn how to better manage it. And there's all kinds of ways. Again, we could have another whole hour long discussion on stress management techniques. Perhaps we should, my team, we should put that one on the list for a subsequent uh, uh, YouTube live stream, uh, stress management techniques. And then third, not a big news flash here, um, smoking. Smoking is bad for you in all kinds of ways. If you haven't heard the news, you heard it here first. Those are your three S's, sleep, stress, and smoking. Uh, get those things dialed in and you will have more awesome immunity. So 
those uh, that was the, the the foundation of our special teams, and now we're going to get in to the real to the real specifics. The the uh, the unique players, each one of them, of which I'm going to give you eleven, that are on our uh, on our special teams, our special immunological football team here. So one more sip of tea, and I'm going to get into it. Thank you all for chiming in. It's great to see you all here. I'm looking at the chat and it's uh, very active. Um, so that's that's awesome. Um, the special teams on our immunologic football team. I'm going to go through a list. And again, you do not need to write this stuff down. Um, it will all come there with you shortly of my top 11 items for optimal or awesome immunity. Um, and here we go, starting at the beginning of the alphabet with good old fashioned vitamin A. Vitamin A is an all-star uh, in terms of immunological health um, for many reasons. Short little lesson on vitamin A is that it comes in kind of two forms. Um, it comes in what we call preformed vitamin A, the active form, which you can consume. Uh, those are called retinoids. And then it also comes in uh, a, a form that's that still needs to be activated into to become true vitamin A, and those are called carotenoids or carotenes. You've heard of this before, beta carotene, and other. There's a whole family of carotenes. Those are very vitamin A like, but they're not quite vitamin A yet. So they need to be activated to become preformed vitamin A. Um, Carotenoids are safe even at very, very high levels. Uh, preformed vitamin A, you need to be a little bit careful with. In doses that are normally used uh, over the counter, vitamin A is very, very safe um, and is widely used. And there's tons and tons of research studies on, uh, on taking vitamin A for the prevention um, of, uh, of immunologic illness and for the treatment of it if it were to ever happen. So vitamin A is our nutrient immunologic all-star, special teams player number one. Uh, moving down through the alphabet, the next one we talked about above. Um, we talked about above in the, uh, in, the, in the risk calculator, and that is vitamin D. Vitamin D, it's widely known as the sunshine vitamin um, because it's a, it's a hormone that, that becomes, it's known as a vitamin, although that's probably a misnomer. It's technically a hormone. It's very biologically active and we make it after exposure uh, to sunshine. There's this, again, awesome, amazingly complex system where sun, ultraviolet light hits the skin, activates a compound which circulates around into the system, including to the liver and to the kidneys. And the end of that is this, the, uh, this, this building, this manufacturing of vitamin D, which is critically important for so many things, right? We know it's important for bone health, and it's also very, very important for immunological health, hence its presence in that calculator. Um, Vitamin D, we can test it in the bloodstream. And if you haven't had your vitamin D level tested, it's especially important that you do. It's even more important if your skin is a darker color, right? So darker pigmented skin has corresponds to lower levels of vitamin D. The darker the skin, the less efficient that 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 transition from sunlight into vitamin D is. And it's particularly important if you have darker skin to make sure that your vitamin D levels are optimized. Um, so what does optimized mean? I said earlier, um, probably shooting for a range between 40 and 60, I think 50 right in the middle there on a lab test is ideal. And depending on who you are and all the different factors that are unique to you, where you live, the color of your skin, et cetera, you, you may need anywhere between 1000 and four or 5,000 or more international units uh, of vitamin D to get to that range. So what you do is you get your lab tested by your doctor. It's an easy thing to do on your next blood test. Look at that number and then supplement accordingly uh, to try to get that number up. Don't repeat the lab test for another three months or so after you've been supplementing to see where you landed, you know, where you are. Uh, and that can fluctuate throughout the year. Um, a lot of people do better taking vitamin D through the winter when there's less sun exposure and in the summer they can back off because they're getting more sun on their skin. So that's uh, immunologic all-star number two, vitamin D. Uh, the third one, I think I went out of order here, uh, should have come right before vitamin D, but that is vitamin C, a long known, very famous immunological all-star in its own right, uh, ascorbic acid. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very useful uh, and been studied uh, for the prevention and for the treatment of a whole bunch of different immunological illnesses. Vitamin C has a role in hundreds of different biochemical reactions. It's absolutely critical for not just immune system health, but 
general health more broadly. Uh, so vitamin C is our all-star. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that. I think you all get the drift there. Um, jumping now to the end of the alphabet, a mineral, a mineral called zinc. It's been getting a lot of press lately and for good reason. Um, zinc is really important in the both the prevention and the treatment of immunologic illnesses, right? So it's a very common deficiency, uh, mostly because people don't eat enough of the foods that contain uh, zinc. So look at lists of foods that contain lots of zinc uh, and, and, and go big on those. And unfortunately, and this is an unfortunate reality, a truth of modern, modern the modern world, the soil, zinc is a mineral, it's a, it's a metal, it's in the soil. And so it gets brought up into the plants that that it grow that are growing in that soil. And modern agricultural practices, even farming practices for plants, have depleted the soil. So if you look at the charts of how much zinc and other minerals uh, is in soil, it's just been on the steady decline over the last several decades which is really unfortunate because if there's not zinc in the soil or not as much zinc in the soil, there won't be as much zinc in the broccoli or in the, in the uh, almonds or whatever, wherever else you might find it. Right? So zinc uh, is one of the minerals that's commonly cited as deficient in agricultural soils. And that's unfortunate because even in people who choose to eat well, they wind up getting less zinc than, uh, than they would have. And this applies not just to zinc, but lots of other minerals that are found in the soil as well. So zinc, very, very important for both treatment and prevention of immunologic illnesses. Um, jumping out of the vitamins and minerals category into something you might call, uh, well, it's an amino acid, maybe an accessory nutritional factor and a, and a, a true immunologic all-star. I'm talking about a compound called N-acetylcysteine, n a C. Um, NAC is a variation on a naturally occurring amino acid called cysteine. And it is extremely useful as an antioxidant, as a detoxifying agent in the liver. In fact, NAC, fascinatingly, is, is used as a, as a pharmaceutical um, it, for various different types of poisonings, right? When there's liver poisoning that happens, patients will get intravenous N-acetylcysteine to help the liver more pro process those toxins more quickly and efficiently. A remarkable compound, but it's also extremely important for immunity. So when people are taking regular doses of NAC, N-acetylcysteine, they are more likely to have an asymptomatic course when it comes to infectious illnesses. So that's kind of what you want, right? We've, we've heard a lot about that, right? If you're going to get exposed to something, it's much better to get exposed and never know about it, right? Like have an asymptomatic course. Got exposed, didn't even know, right? Immune system took care of it, wiped out, you know, did that whole awesome process that we described without you ever knowing anything about it. Well, people who take N-acetylcysteine regularly have a greater chance of that happening. That's a be better outcome. And so, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a remarkable thing and one of my favorite immunological all-stars for that reason. Um, the next one on the list is, is quercetin. Quercetin, many of you have heard me talk about before. Um, another favorite compound, I know it's so nerdy to talk about you know, bioflavonoid compounds as my favorites, but, um, but, but there it is. Uh, quercetin is one of my favorite, maybe my favorite, uh, bioflavonoid compound it comes from onions. Um, it's a yellow, a yellow powder and it is, uh, it, there's a lot of promising research on quercetin, um, for immunologic health for, for, for several reasons. Another little detour into awesomeness. I talked about zinc earlier and, uh, it's it's uh it's it's properties um, for cellular health and immunologic health even even has some antiviral cap capabilities as well, but zinc needs to get inside of cells in order to do its job. It turns out that quercetin, this bioflavonoid compound from onions that I'm talking about, um, quercetin is like it opens the 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 windows. It opens these little these little ports on cellular membranes to allow the entry of zinc. Quercetin is called a zinc ionophore. It's amazing. Um, and when you co-administer, when you take quercetin along with zinc, the quercetin helps open the door and the zinc can get in. So that's another little bit of, of, of physiologic or immunologic awesomeness for you. Um, and part of the reason why I am such a big fan of quercetin. Um, 
And then a few herbal medicines. I'm going to give you a handful of my favorite herbal medicines for, for immunologic health right now as well. Um, I'll speak first in their Latin names. This is Scutellaria bicalensis. You don't need to take notes on this. This is this is where it really gets tricky. Scutellaria is called skullcap. Uh, it's a it's a kind of a minty like herbal medicine. It's been studied in China for many many decades, both in test tubes in animals and in humans. Um, and a typical you know. Th- th- typically combined with other herbal medicines many many times uh, the ones i'm about to talk to is to talk to you as well uh, about right now um and skullcap is one of my favorite immunologic all-stars especially for the times that we are in right now um it combines beautifully uh, with another herbal medicine that's called Andrographis paniculata. Andrographis paniculata is um is a there, there's a compound inside of this plant called Andrographis which are called andrographolides. And, and what these things do is they, they're, it's called immunomodulation. And it's a term I haven't used yet today, but it's an interesting term. What a lot of people like to think very simply about immunity and think, you know, there's immune deficiency where the person's weak and vulnerable. And then there's immune excess, right? Where the immune system's overreacting, like uh, in the cases of allergy or in cases of autoimmunity. And, you know, I, I think that's a helpful way to think about it. Immune systems can be weak and therefore vulnerable or or too strong, uh, too strong and overreact um, in, in, in any number of ways. But the reality, and not surprisingly, is that it's, it's not that simple. Um, and any person who's vulnerable on in, in any of those ways, the too weak or too strong, usually has an immune system that's dysfunctional, right? It's out of balance, right? And the idea of providing these fuels, whether they're vitamins, minerals, herbal medicines, is to modulate, to restore some balance to an otherwise imbalanced immune system. So it's not about strengthening an immune system that's too weak or calming down or suppressing an immune system that's too strong because the immune system wasn't too weak or too strong to begin with. It was just out of whack, out of balance. And so andrographis is a prototypical immunomodulator. It helps bring back into balance. Um, And the next herbal medicine does something very, very similar, although through a slightly different kind of biochemical channel. And that is, that is astragalus. Um, Astragalus is, uh, Membranicus is the last name I told you I was going to use Latin names. Astragalus um, is another uh, herbal medicine. It's a, it's a, it's a a root extract that um, is also an immunomodulator, not unlike uh, andrographis. And then the next plant, uh, which is actually not so much a plant, but more of a mushroom type of plant is called cordyceps, a really unusual sort of interesting uh, fungal mycelium uh, in in the mushroom family uh, that is classically known as an adaptogen, again, helping to restore that balance, helping people adapt to stressful circumstances with a particular focus on immune system health. uh, That is, uh, that is cordyceps. And then the last uh, number 11 of my immunologic 11 uh, all-stars here is um, is green tea. Let me take a moment to celebrate that here. Green tea, you've heard me talk about before. Um, it's a source of this compound that's called EGCG, epigallocatechin gallate. And uh, and that, that compound has been studied immensely. I mean, if you type in EGCG into PubMed, the medical literature, you'll see hundreds of papers demonstrating the usefulness of this compound, which is, which is inside in high amounts in green tea extract for uh, not just immune, immunological benefits, although that's one of the main areas where it's been researched, um, but but health across the board. And we've long known that people who consume green tea regularly uh, have better uh, better health in general, including better immunological health. So that is my list of my top eleven immunologic all stars. So thank you for being here for that. And now I want to get to uh, to the meat of our discussion. Um, I am grateful to work with Up Wellness, uh, this this fantastic company with a fantastic team, and it gives me the ability to do things that are remarkable like this. So I just gave you eleven immunologic all stars, and I'm going to show you now this um, something that I'm really really proud of. This uh, is called Immune Eleven X. Hopefully you can see that there. 
Immune 11X, it's not going to be any big surprise to any of you that Immune 11X is a source of all of those all-stars. I, uh, I am grateful to be able to take my research, my clinical experience, and combine them into something like a product that contains exactly the blend of things that I'm looking for. And here is where I want to tell you about the free gift that I have for you. So Immune 11X is my, uh, my favorite uh, and my very own uh, immune support supplement. And if my, my team right now in the chat box is going to put a link for you, and that link is going to take you over to Up Wellness's website. And if you go to Up Wellness's website today um, and make any purchase, no matter any of the products that we have there, I will have a bottle of Immune 11X added on to your order for free. So you, whatever else you get, one of the a bottle of this will get automatically added to your order today. This will last for 24 hours. So right now it's just approaching one o'clock Eastern time uh, on Friday. That uh, that special offer will end uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, Saturday. So for those of you who are interested, um, the notes are on their way. For those of you who have any interest in supporting your immune system with Immune 11X, all you got to do to get a free bottle is head on over to upwellness.com using the link that is uh, that is that has been pasted into the chat box there. Um, and, and a free bottle of Immune 11X will be added to your order today, and that'll stay live for the next uh, 24 hours. So I hope that this was uh, enjoyable to all of you. We came in kind of right on time. Um, I wish that I had the opportunity in these venues when, we, when I have this many people in a live stream like this, it's really hard to um, make everybody feel heard and get to everyone's questions. I'll have more for you on an opportunity there shortly. But um, it was a pleasure to talk to you all today. Thank you uh, so much for sticking with me. Um, we are um, really excited about the kind of engagement that we've had um, on these live streams. It looks like uh, it's something that you all value. We value you uh, intensely at Up Wellness. And so it's great to have you here. Um, and this was a treat. I hope you all got something out of it. Um, I'm seeing. Uh, seeing comments that this was helpful uh, and that just makes me feel good. So you all are awesome to stick with our theme. I'm not going to give away uh, who I might be rooting for in the Super Bowl coming up, um, but uh, I hope it's a good game for all. Take good care, everyone. Be well. Bye-bye.